You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. If you hear one phrase in our industry, it's that it's evolve. We need to evolve and we are evolving. Convenience stores are changing dramatically in what they offer and how they deliver convenience. So Evolve is going to be our topic today. And to join us is Molly Long. She is Vice President of Store Evolution and Design at 7-Eleven. She's leading the evolution there. So welcome, Molly. Well, thanks so much for having me, Jeff. It's a it's an honor to be here. So we visited the evolution stores. Uh, there's some in our market in the D.C. area, but we went there to Dallas to check out the Evolution stores in Dallas as part of our Ideas to Go videos that we showed at um, the NAC show and they're online now. Can you kind of describe the whole idea of Evolution? Uh, obviously, 7-Eleven has an enormous footprint in the industry, but the uh, Evolution stores are a growing part of that footprint. Yeah. Um, so Evolution stores were established in, in 2019. And Really, they're a result of trying to reimagine our stores through our customers' eyes. We want to attract new customers as well as increase the frequency of existing customers um, and in doing so, improve the perception of the brand overall. So the original premise behind Evolution Stores is that we know consumer expectations are still increasing. We want to make sure that we create environments and platforms that help meet customers where they're at and ideally anticipate those needs for the future. Now, sometimes different companies have different words that just jump out. Um, Was the whole evolution concept, did you guys have the name evolution and or was it we want to do this and then somebody in a break or something like that said, we should be calling them the evolution stores. What was that whole process like in coming up with the name? Yeah, it was funny because we, we really are um, a a team that didn't exist before necessarily and at inside of 7-Eleven. And so there was some back and forth trying to figure out what do we call this thing? Are we the store innovation team? Are we, you know, there were a number of things kind of thrown about and, um, and I, it was actually a conversation with with Chris Tonko and myself, um, our, our uh, COO, who, you know, we were bouncing a few words around. And then I can't remember whether it was him or I came up with, what about evolution? And it just sort of clicked because it's so um, closely articulated what we were trying to do, which is evolve our experience into, you know, into where the customer was headed. Um, and, and so through that was sort of the birth of that term. And 7-Eleven has, you know, uh, I mentioned enormous footprint, just opened st- store number 77,711. Yes. Uh, and you have all these stores, yet you're basically reinventing the whole idea of 7-Eleven. And what are the things that are on the table in looking at evolution? What are things that are off the table in terms of looking at how do you create these evolution stores? Pretty much everything is on the table um, within reason. And I think the one of our governing filters is, is it, it, can we see it eventually being scalable? If it's not something that we could see being something that we could eventually roll out into it doesn't have to be all stores, but a great majority of stores, we tend to not try to focus on those ideas. We want to create things that can have the potential to go far and get rolled out system wide. Um, you know, our at our core, our mission is to reimagine the stores through the eyes of the customers using R&D. And so we really want to gain an understanding. We want to test new concepts and then we want to scale those concepts that are working. And so it's everything from the store, the in-store environment, the interior, the exterior, the types of materials that we use, the lighting, little things like music in store that can really add to the ambiance of the store, all the way to actual platforms, giving people new things and reasons to come into 7-Eleven for uh, fresh food and proprietary beverage and new ways to make it easier for the operator to um, 
work on the store as well. How do they load the vault more efficiently? How do we, so it's really, you know, we view, we've got two customers really where one of them is the actual customer who's shopping the store and the other importantly is the operator. So how do we make sure we balance and come up with innovations that can help service both? 7-Eleven, I imagine, has more robust resources than some some other stores out there. Uh, but are there anything that any things that might be similar in terms of what others can look at? In how do you do research? Is it is it a combination of focus groups talking to customers? Is it having a clipboard and just watching people? Yeah. Um, what are, what are some of the ways that you find out? Uh, what customers want and what they'll gravitate towards. Well, you mentioned a couple of of um, elements that we definitely do and, and we've leaned on. And I think that there is no substitute for literally sitting inside of a store and just observing. You learn so much by absorbing and even working the store. And so I've challenged members, each member of my team to go out and actually work in these stores to help learn, especially the people who are developing these platforms be the ones who are having to clean it on its weekly maintenance cycle. Be the ones who are interacting with the customer and understanding and getting to see firsthand their questions. That in and of itself makes us as a team so much smarter when it comes to developing these these items. But we also, and in terms of anticipating, we look at competitors. We love looking at all the great things that the competition out there is doing. We look at People and competitors are very broadly defined, not just C store, but we look at all types of retail, even you know fashion and clothing retail to home goods to, um, and then obviously restaurants and food and beverage retailers. So we're we're really interested in um, what others are doing, and then really looking at um, just the the uh, customer in general. How do we understand? We use syndicated data. And then we'll use obviously focus groups and some other research when stores do open to walk them through and sort of take them a, a more regimented way to take them through the store so we can get inside their head and really understand what they think about different things, different aspects. Um, in, in the Ideas to Go video, we visited a couple different stores in Dallas. One was 5,000 square feet and it was amazing. You walk in and there's the, the tacos and you can smell them. You can see them making the taco shells. It was it was experiential, and it was a big store. But you also had that same taco program that was working in a much smaller store that was about half the size. Um, now that store had an entirely different feel, in, in different but no less cool. That one almost had more of a focus on music and video, and it. it I don't want to call it like a club, but there was an energy. <laughs> there was an energy that that all this music and, and video lended. Um, so it really is pretty impressive in taking all the ideas, testing them in a lab, a living lab store, and then making them work in something half that size. And, and I'd say that's really intentional. One of our mission, you know, we don't, these aren't, these aren't like, the best of the best locations. We are very intentional about picking locations that we believe are, I guess I will use the term average locations or locations that could rep, be representative of a broad swath of our, of, you know, of our potential locations. And not just that, but we also really are trying to explore a diverse um, size of store as well because it's so important for us to understand how much can we stretch and how how can we condense? Because, you know, we want to understand how big can we go? Should we go? But when we need to, what happens when we go smaller? And where are the puts and takes? And what do we have to give up? And what does the customer think about those elements that we have to give up? And so those exploring those different, you know, the larger stores, the smaller stores, those are all part of this R&D effort that helps us get smarter and learn more about what's working and how is it working and how do we then take that and apply it to something that ultimately we would want to scale. Well, and, and you have evolution stores in a couple different markets and there's a couple stores in a couple different markets, but you know, a dozen or two or maybe more now, but um, will there be a point where it's more common than not that stores will be evolutions 
uh, where where the brand will move that far forward, where everyone will have a focus on prepared food, where there there is more of this club atmosphere. Uh, how far do you take this evolution um, to individual stores? We definitely didn't set out to do this for one store here, one store there for, you know, a handful of stores. Um, we, you know, I don't have details that we can necessarily get into today, but I can tell you that there will be a point in time where our new stores coming out of the ground start to act and feel and look very different than they do today. And I can also say that we're working really hard on figuring out how to efficiently remodel existing stores so that they can start to feel and act in a way that we know our customers are looking for them to act. And that's just sometimes just pulling part. It's not, you know, redoing a whole store, but taking a little bit. Uh, I saw with the, with the shelf lighting, or maybe it's the, the uh, cosmetics or something like that. Is that, is that, Exactly. Yeah, it's figuring out which elements really resonate, which elements are are most important, and then using those to help drive your remodels. So um, thinking about the store, uh, the stores that we visited, the one that was 5,000 square feet, you had a very unique way of introducing the store to the community. Uh, It's not enough to have a store opening. Um, (laughs) You went big and you turned it into, I believe it was called Gamers Paradise. And you partnered with a a, a gaming company and you had a celebrity there overnight. And it it was a total hangout. It was like it was like the best living room ever. Yeah. Uh, Can you can you describe where do you well, you just can can probably describe that better than (laughs) I can. What what was it and how did you come up with that idea? Yeah, so Gamers Paradise, I wish I could take credit for the idea. No, it was our awesome marketing department. And they came to us with this, this idea. They had a partnership with um, with Sony PlayStation. And we're really trying to figure out how do we bring that to life. At the same time, our Park and Abrams Evolution Store was opening up. And they developed this idea that was literally the coolest thing ever. I would have killed for something like this, where you get to spend the night inside of a 7-Eleven and basically make it your playground for that whole period of time. You get, um, they, and they completely, you know, picture an awesome store, but then um, throw in like mood lighting and a lounge area and bathroom amenities and all of these like really really fun attention to detail things plus all you can drink slurpees and snacks and you know basically free free reign in the store coupled with you know the the lounge area had gaming chairs where they were you know gaming with these you know a a a gaming celebrity plus we had Dak Prescott on um quarterback of the Cowboys and um just all of these uh really fun and exciting things that this um, these lucky individuals got to experience. And then we were able to showcase that and help generate excitement for the grand opening at the same time. So it was really otherworldly. I, I hadn't quite seen anything like it, but they did a fantastic job. And I assume that it, it's as much for TV coverage or newspaper and really about the new media, social media, where I imagine it, as the kids say, blew up. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Um, when looking at those types of ways to tell a different brand, um, you want to also maintain the, the, the joy and the love for the current brand. So I know when you talked about nothing is really off the table, I would imagine that there are some things like, Hey, we're going to have big gulps. We're going to have slurpees. Um, but maybe we'll talk about presenting them a different way, uh, where, at least at the evolution stores, it's almost a food forward store where traditionally convenience stores are thought of as beverage forward, but then you don't have to necessarily combo me a meal like a, a, a fountain beverage. You can get pretty much any type of beverage in the store and there are dozens of options. So th- that's kind of a, I thought a very unique way when I went to the store, how it was communicated to me that it's not, you can't really sell value meals like number two, because it's not just uh, a dispensed beverage. You can get 
coffee, you can get tea, you can get Slurpee, you get so many beverage choices to pair with your food. Um, is there a, also a way to, to, how do you tighten that up a little bit, I guess, if you will, because there are so many options, you don't want it to be paralyzing to someone. Yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a good uh, question. And, and it's a balance, right? One of the things that we've learned is how important customization is to customers, and they don't want to settle. But at the same time, you also hear that with too many choices, that also becomes paralyzing. And so it is going to be a balance that we have to strike. And fortunately, with our platforms, what we try to do is be really intuitive about the way things are designed so that a customer can come in and, and get what they want, but be able to make the choices um, in, in a way that doesn't become overwhelming. And I think, you know, it's true that nothing is off the table in the sense that we will evaluate everything. But it is very important to us that we stay true to the ethos that is 7-Eleven. And, you know, it's an iconic 94-year-old brand um, that has a ton of rich history. That's really important to us to not throw away. And so we want to make sure that this new breed of 7-Eleven still hangs on to what makes it 7-Eleven and what makes it unique, um, but but done in a way that becomes very relevant to the next, you know, to a broader swath of, of customers. Um, 95 years and counting, yes. uh, not too far away from that 100th anniversary. Now, I want to talk about space, but uh, to do that, and, and Slurpees in space specifically, Okay, you can tell by that music, uh, we have a quick interruption here. Before we talk about Slurpees in space, we have a space trivia question for you. Molly, we are starting um, some some trivia with our podcast, and you are our first one that we're testing this. Oh, week, so I feel so excited congratulations. about this. Congratulations. <laughs> um, before we talk about Slurpees in space, I want to talk about uh, astronauts who have been at the NAC show. We've had three astronauts who have been at the NAC show over the years, and one of those three was the last person to walk on the moon. Okay. Uh, the three astronauts we had were Jim Lovell, Alan Bean, and Gene Cernan. Any thought on who was yes. the last man to be on the moon? I believe it's Gene Cernan. Is that right? You are correct. And wow. uh, for that... <laughs> I, was not was... I was not expecting to get it, to get it right. I was excited. Yep, he was uh, on Apollo 17, and he was the most recent of 12 people to walk on the moon, so congratulations. Um, we started off our trivia on the right foot. Woo! All right. Woo. So, stress gone. Let's talk a little bit more about space. <laughs> Thanks. Specifically, you did something that was, 7-Eleven did something last year where a Slurpee went to space for the first time. Yes. Um, I've seen the video. I've seen the pictures. Tell, tell us about that. That the, the physical Slurpee went up there, yeah. came back down. Somebody knew where it was because you were following it and um, had a treat. Isn't that so the craziest that. thing? So, yeah. right, uh, to celebrate our, I think it was our 94th birthday, um, we delivered a Slurpee where no Slurpee has been before, uh, space, which, um, which was a really, I think, creative idea. Um, I think it was launched at a 7-Eleven store in Michigan, which is in the United States. Michigan is the Slurpee capital of, of the U.S., um, the state that has the most Slurpee drinks. So uh, it, at, to be able to celebrate this historic launch, they commissioned a Slurpee in space themed mural um, as a thank you to the loyal customers. And um, it went up to space. I don't know all of the technical details, to be honest, is like, a question I have, which I don't have an answer to, is did it melt on the way up there? And, you know, all of those little details that I don't have the answers to. But um, I do know I was an excited customer as as the rest of uh, as the rest of them um, just to see Slurpee there. And it was certainly a proud moment to be part of Team 7-Eleven to, to see something so iconic um, in the background of the earth. 
yeah, it was really cool to see the images. And it's not like one of these rocket ships that went off and had like two or three separations or something like that. This was all done with, I'm oversimplifying it, like a, somewhat of like a weather balloon that just took it back up and then it came back down. Right, right. Yes. Isn't that incredible? Well, uh, I it's going to be tough to top for 95 this year. <laughs> yeah, what are we going to do for 95, let alone 100? Yeah. Um, so kind of wrapping things up, you know, we talked about, um, the whole concept of evolution. We talked about, um, how it translates to some of these smaller stores. And if it doesn't work in an average store, then well, you know, it may not work when you roll things out, you're getting honest feedback and it's really moving, really moving the needle. Um, is there anything that you feel that, 7-Eleven needs to be known for, or the Evolution stores can drive 7-Eleven to be known for as more of these stores open up? Yeah. Um, so our vision at 7-Eleven, just in general, is to be the first choice for convenience anytime, anywhere. That's our stated vision. Um, but I think, you know, for me, I want 7-Eleven to be known as the brand that is meeting customers where they're at. And even anticipating their needs. I want us to be recognized as a company that is evolving and constantly innovating to make our customers' lives just a little easier. Um, I wanna introduce 7-Eleven as a relevant choice for people who don't shop us today, as well as get those people who do shop us today to come in more often. And we do that, the way we do that is through having a culture of R&D and innovation. And that's a, a part that I'm really proud to uh, have a role in, in helping shape this future. Yeah, anytime, anywhere is a phrase I probably heard a dozen times on my visit. That is certainly something that's ingrained in um, the culture in terms yes. of how evolution moves forward. Um, thank you for joining us today, Molly. Thank you so much for having me. And speaking of anytime, anywhere, you can listen to Convenience Matters podcast anytime, anywhere on all kinds of interesting platforms. So subscribe, uh, become a fan, take a listen. We always could use more. So thanks again, Molly. And thanks you all for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.